Our service doesn't end after we leave the military. The mission changes, but we still find the need to be of service. What's yours? Listen in as we talk to our guests about their military careers and life after the uniform in their second service. This podcast is sponsored by Fortis et Fidelis, a brand dedicated to honoring the brave and faithful. Make sure to check out fortis-fidelis.com and support the podcast by subscribing to the show and leaving us a five-star review on all the podcast platforms. Now, let's get to the show. What's going on, everyone? Raiden here. And we just want to let you all know that for the second year in a row, the Brave and Faithful podcast has been nominated by the Veteran Podcast Awards as one of the top best overall podcasts and the best Navy-hosted podcasts. Make sure you all go to veteranpodcastawards.com slash vote and vote for our podcast for the best overall and the best Navy-hosted podcast. Voting begins August 8th and ends September 18th. So again, head over to veteranpodcastawards.com slash vote and vote for the Brave and Faithful podcast for the best overall and the best Navy hosted podcast. Thank you all for your support. What's going on, everyone? Welcome to another episode of the Brave and Faithful podcast. Uh, Today, I have another Air Force veteran. He is the founder of MilitaryTransition.org. MilitaryTransition.org's mission is to improve the transition process for military families and help organizations build their brand across the military and veteran community. I have Mr. Brian Nicewinder. I'm hoping I said that last name right, Brian. Red, you said it right. Uh, well done. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me on your podcast. It's uh, it's an honor to speak with you and, and with your uh, with your audience. Awesome. I appreciate the time, Brian. Um, so I mentioned you were you were in the Air Force. Uh, reading your bio here, you served for over thirty years uh, in the Air Force. Can you just describe to our audience a little bit about you know your time in this in the service, um, and then maybe talk a little bit about your own transition as well. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, so um, almost 27 years total, that was active duty and reserve time, but it actually started uh, 36 years ago, back in 1986. I oh, graduated wow. from high school in uh, Finley, Ohio, a nice little community up in Northwest Ohio, Flag City, USA. And uh, I went out to the Air Force Academy. And four years later, uh, I graduated with a class of 90, uh, Mighty 90 is what I would call our class. And uh, came out on active duty as an intel officer. Uh, I uh, loved it. I had two major assignments uh, in the uh, intel business. Uh, the first one was up at um, what was then Elmendorf. Now it is a joint base with Fort Rich. Um, but we lived on the Army side with uh, Fort Richardson. And we worked on the Air Force side. And uh, we worked with the Air Force and with the Navy. So it was our uh, quasi joint tour. You didn't have joint tours back in the early 90s, but we got that joint experience. Okay. Um, loved Alaska. It was great. Um, uh, loved it in the summer. The, the winter, you know, you had to catch a lot of hockey games, uh, but it was great. And then we went from there to uh, Offutt Air Force Base. And there I did uh, the uh, RC 135, the Airborne um, Intel community, another great assignment. Uh, and from there, I decided it was time to uh, to get out and go see corporate America. So six years on active duty, then another 21 years as a reservist. But I spent uh, the next um, 27 years in the public and private sectors. And I've had a chance to work with uh, countless service members, veterans, and spouses uh, during the transition, coach, hire, mentor, develop, uh, survey. It's been a, It's been a great experience. Awesome, awesome. So you, you know, you mentioned you've worked in as well in, in corporate America, America while serving in in, in the reserves. Uh, you know, you work for Fortune 500 companies. Um, what do you feel is like some of the biggest challenges, or maybe what were some of your challenges in the beginning transitioning from the military to, you know, uh, corporate America? 
Yeah, so so um, time in service was great. Um, you know, I, I was most appreciative of the uh, the people that I got to work with and those that invested a great deal of time in me and helped me develop my skills. Uh, lots of great senior NCOs, lots of officers, uh, and I learned a lot. You know, soft and hard skills. Um, when I transitioned, I transitioned in the uh, the mid '90s. And there was no such thing as tap back in the mid nineties. Uh, yeah. You've got a DD form 214, a handshake, and uh, they walk you to the door. So I am a big fan of the fact that we have transition assistance today. It is a big change from back then. They are continuing to make improvements on the transition assistance program. But for me, there was no such thing. And so um, I had an average transition, I would say, compared to a lot of others. And, and what made it maybe easier than some was that I used a, a, a JMO recruiter, a junior military officer recruiter, um, and that helped bring structure to my transition. Um, and uh, I'll talk more about that here in a second. Um, one of the things we do at militarytransition.org, you mentioned in the intro that we use data to help service members understand and navigate their transition. So we have literally surveyed thousands of service members, veterans, spouses, employers, and when you survey large groups like that, you find that there are, uh, there's no single like one size fits all transition solution, okay. but there are consistent themes that come out around the transition. Um, and those themes, one of the most important aspects of those themes is to start early and to have a transition plan. And so my transition, having a recruiter help bring that structure um, to what's a really confusing process. And so I'm very thankful. Uh, and they also gave me an immediate network, which I really didn't have, right? I went to a service academy. Uh, I was one of the first in my class to, to transition out uh, from active duty. And so I didn't really have an existing network of folks that were already out in industry that I could reach out and engage with. And so a recruiter actually um, helped me in that regard. And I'm super thankful that I, that I used them the game has changed significantly since then with a lot of programs that are available for service members to utilize. Uh, but my transition, again, thankful that I use that, uh, use that recruiter. And you said that was a JMO. Uh, yeah. What does that stand for? Junior? Uh, junior military officer. So there's um, a lot of different recruiters that are out there. Uh, there are some that work with all service members and there are some that really specialize. And so I use one that really specialized in junior military officers. Um, and uh, they, they were great. I uh, have, you know, only good things to say about the process. Um, again, uh, you know, the game has changed a lot in, in the past, uh, you know, 20 some years. Uh, but uh, back then, that was the uh, absolute best, best path uh, for, for me uh, going out into corporate America. My first job, actually, so I'm on the call tonight from uh, Cincinnati. And my first role in corporate America was with Procter and & Gamble. And um, I mentioned earlier that I was an Intel officer. All you do in Intel is you take data and information and you put it into context for decisions. It can be tactical decisions, you know, targets that you're going to strike could be strategic decisions, but that's really all you do. And what I learned is that corporate America does the same thing. So my first job at P&G was on a big consumer brand team and I did market research, uh, business intelligence, uh, taking data information and, you know, putting that into context for decisions for the brand. We collected the data through different means, but at the end of the day, analysis, you know, what does the data mean? What do we do about it? Uh, is, uh, you know, that analytic process is the same thing I really did when I had the uniform on. So uh, a lot of the skills that I learned in uniform translated soft skills, you know, interacting with people, being adaptable, um, but the hard skills, those analytic skills, they were a perfect translate uh, translation into uh, what industry was looking for. Okay. Okay. So, you know, in sharing your, your transition story and, you know, how you went about and got started in, in corporate America, um, was there any, any specific event or moment that kind of led you to make, you know, starting and founding military, uh, military transitions? There was. Or, okay. Can you describe that to our audience? Yeah, absolutely. So, um, I, uh, helped or directly, you know, recruited, hired, developed uh, lots of veterans um, from all branches, ranks, uh, walks of life. And what I discovered was that all service members ask the same types of questions when they think about what follows service. They ask things like, 
what does someone like me with my education, skills, and experience, what do they do in the civilian world? Are they happy? Do they like it? Does their family like it? What lessons did they learn that I can apply to my transition? They ask the same questions, but they want to know for someone that has a profile like theirs. So, right, I was uh, Air Force. I had a bachelor's degree. I was Intel. And I wanted to live in the Midwest. If you were Navy, E5, radar technician uh, with an associate's degree that wanted to live on the West Coast, same questions, but you wanted different answers. So I felt like we owed service members and, and spouses, for that matter, we owed them the same level of rigor that we applied to intelligence for national security or intelligence, business intelligence, market research that we do in industry. We owed them the same level of rigor when they think about that transition process. And so that's what really gave rise to uh, the concept uh, that we employ at militarytransition.org. We have interactive data dashboards where you can put in branch, rank, years of service, age, specialty, MOS, AFSC, um, uh, years of service, uh, and it will give you nine pages of data around those key transition questions that fit your profile. You can see how the entire community answers those questions, and then you can see how people with that profile answer. So nine questions or nine pages of data around your profile, and then two pages that actually show you who's in the data set. Um, and so that's how we really started. Um, and we then took that same approach that we use for service members and we applied that to military spouses. We know that there's a, a tremendous issue with uh, spouse employment. And so we took the same approach, the same rigor to help build a interactive dashboard for them. We also learned that there was no single repository of reputable transition resources. And so we built the very first um, aggregate, you know, uh, battery library of transition resources. And then we started just um, building all kinds of resources that we knew service members needed. And I'll talk all about those here in a bit. Uh, the most recent is a number of transition guidebooks. And I'll, I'll say up front too, that everything we do is free of charge. We give mm. all this away. We don't sell anything. Uh, we give it away for free. And it's our way to be able to give back to the community. That's, that's awesome, Brian. And, you know, just just going back into the the organization, can you just share with when when did you um, when did you start militarytransition.org, and um, you know what were some of the challenges that you face when you when initially? Yeah, uh, so we uh, I, I've been working with obviously veterans uh, for the past two decades, but we actually started collecting data around 2016. Uh, the interactive dashboards, um, the first was for service members based upon uh, the data and lessons that veterans share. Uh, I think in 2018 is when we actually added in for military spouses. So there is kind of the timeline. Um, and uh, the challenges were really, um, uh, we were unknown at the time. Nobody knew who we were. Um, we had this amazing concept. Uh, but we didn't have any data. We didn't have any examples to show. So we needed to really kind of start building the organization up. Once we actually had some data and we started exposing what we were going to be doing with the data and, and showing how that we were going to share all this data and lessons learned, um, then uh, obviously moment, mo uh, momentum picked up uh, significantly and it has done ever since. Uh, and uh, one of the big things we also pride ourselves in is we take these really complex issues and we make them simple to understand. We have a whole crew of uh, visual designers that, uh, that take all these really complex issues and make them simple. We uh, pride ourselves. Uh, and having some awesome infographics and then these uh, transition guidebooks short to the point and give you the absolute, you know, here is the, uh, the gouge, you know, Barney style of uh, here's what you need to know about your transition. And then, um, you know, for, for our audience that may be, you know, in that, you know, in that transition phase or, or, you know, or looking to retire or separate from, from the service, What's one actionable step that you can kind of give them to, um, you know, get started as far as um, with with the military military transition uh, organization? Red and I would say, um, you know, the first thing is come to our website, and it's actually military-transition.org. So we had to put a dash in there uh, between okay. military and transition. Uh, so go to our site, um, and on our site, you're going to see all these different resources. But start with kind of our core uh, transition information flyer. And it gives you really all the macro facts that you need to understand um, about the transition process. Earlier, I mentioned when you survey thousands of veterans, there are five themes that come up. 
and you see these throughout the, the platform. Um, and so I'll walk through these just so you know, um, you know where we're coming from. Um, and again, there's no one size fits all solution, but here is what the dominant elements of a successful transition are. The first one is to start preparing early. 84% of veterans say that you should start preparing early. We recommend um, 24 months, 24 months, two years basically before you actually take off the uniform is when you ought to start thinking about it. And yeah. I can talk a lot more about that first step, uh, but let me get through this list of five. So the second one is to have a transition plan. 83% of veterans say that it's uh, re really important. Uh, the third is to network or build your network. Uh, and 86%, uh, that's the most recommended aspect of a successful transition. Next, learn how to translate your skills. 83% uh, recommend that. That is the most difficult aspect of a successful transition. It takes a lot of time to learn how to really translate your skills so that an employer sees value. And then finally, be patient. And there are a lot of 82% uh, of veterans say to be patient. Um, uh, it's going to be challenging. It's going to be stressful. In fact, 48% uh, of veterans say that the transition was more difficult than they expected. And 76% say that it's stressful. Um, so it's going to be a challenge. Um, you know, be patient, stick with it. And you didn't become a soldier, sailor, airman, Marine or guardian overnight, uh, and the transition doesn't happen overnight either. So that speaks to that uh, fifth element when you survey thousands of veterans. Yeah, Brian, I'm I'm looking. At, I'm actually looking at the uh, the survey, the, the graphics that uh, you were describing earlier. You, you know, you mentioned about the difficulty of the transition. More than uh, about forty eight percent, close to fifty percent said it's more difficult than expected, and the uh, first civilian salary or pay was. 38% uh, said it was worse than what they expected. So it's not all, uh, you know, it's, it's obviously, um, you know, a, a big step in, in, in your career and in your life as well. So um, make sure you're, for our audience out there, go to military-transition.org just to, and it's, it's all free, you know what I mean? So you can get all the information that you can to, to prepare yourself once you do make that transition. Want to support an active duty owned brand? Head over to fortis fidelis.com. Again, that's fortis fidelis.com. And help us in honoring the brave and faithful service of our nation's defenders. All proceeds will help us create and provide memorial coins to the families of our fallen service members. Again, that's fortis fidelis.com. And help fortis fidelis and honoring the brave and faithful. What's going on everyone? Raiden here. And we just want to let y'all know that for the second year in a row, the Brave and Faithful podcast has been nominated by the Veteran Podcast Awards. That's one of the top best overall podcasts the best navy hosted podcast make sure you all go to veteranpodcastawards.com slash vote and vote for our podcast for the best overall and the best navy hosted podcast voting begins august 8th and ends september 18th so again head over to veteranpodcastawards.com slash vote and vote for the brave and faithful podcast for the best overall and the best Navy hosted podcast. Thank you all for your support. Um, so, so, so Brian, you know, for, for our, for the audience that's out there right now, what's, what do you think is one thing that you'd want them to take away from, from this episode and, and hearing about military uh, transition? Yeah. Um, well, uh, the first thing is that there are all these resources, but really the thing that is um, kind of the, the, the lead that we want everybody to see are the transition guidebooks. And there are three of them so far, and there are more on the way. Um, so the first one is Truths About the Military Transition. It has 10 hard-hitting facts about uh, you know the transition process, and every service member ought to have a copy of that book, and they ought to have it you know the day they put the uniform on, 
because decisions that you make while serving will have an impact on your future marketability and your future options. So really kind of break it down with these 10 truths that you need to understand. Um, the second book, it, it's a competition, right? When you go for that dream job, you're going to be competing against veterans and non-veterans. And uh, there's an ancient proverb that says that if you want to be successful in any competition, the first thing you have to do is learn the rules of the game and then play by the rules. And, and so this is really kind of the rule book. Um, and it's called Winning the Employment Game. And it starts with really, you know, here are the rules. Here how, here's how the game is played. I know there are a lot of Barrick lawyers that are out there that tell you, you know, how the process works because they talk to a friend of a friend, you know, um, and uh, maybe, you know, they, they, they're still wearing the uniform. They have not transitioned. They've never gone through an interview. They've never hired anybody, you know, and, and they're, they're sharing stories of how the process works. We provide ground truth. Uh, so I have been out there on the front lines for two decades and, um, this is really how the game is played. And so understanding that it really walks you through this competition. You know, what are the rules? Uh, how do you how do you get started for this competition? Understanding the resume, the interview process, and then um, some tactics of how to win the game and how you put together your specific playbook to win the game. So great book, lots of great feedback on that one. The third book is uh, it talks about challenges around the military transition and it's written not just to service members but also to military families and to employers and so it really talks about 12 overarching challenges that service members and families endure there are voids to fill barriers to break concerns to address and limitations to overcome those are the four major categories and then within those categories there are specific challenges and ways to overcome those challenges, and then how employers can help service members and families navigate the transition process. Things that we've seen from an employer standpoint uh, to, uh, to make the process better and to help service members or help the companies better integrate service members. We are really excited uh, to, uh, to publish our, uh, our fourth uh, transition guidebook, and this one's gonna be out uh, prior to Veterans Day of 2022. Um, and it really highlights over two decades, we keep seeing the same 12 mistakes that service members make over and over and over again. And so mm. we're going to call out those specific 12 mistakes uh, so that you know them, you can avoid them and you can overcome them. So the mistakes and then, you know, ways to avoid and overcome. And uh, those that have read it so far uh, are uh, really excited for us to be able to get it out. I've heard comments, you know, that this is the best book uh, to date. Um, so it's going to be really impactful. That's awesome. Thanks for thanks for mentioning those those ebooks. Um, actually, once we're done here, I'm going to go to the website and and download those three that's available right now. Um, so the first, I just want to go over these uh, these, these ebooks real quick. Um, and the first one you mentioned was uh, truths about the uh, military transition. So Brian, what do you think is um, one misconception that's out there about military transition. Um, yeah, so uh, there's lots of mis, uh, mis uh, perceptions about the military transition. Um, and I could, you know, we could be on the call for a couple hours, but um, I would say that. Um, uh, what would be, say, what would be like the number one or, you know, the top answer? Uh, yeah, it's, uh, yeah, so um, uh, I will say this um, veterans don't do enough self reflection before they start the process. Uh, you can't hit a target you don't have, right? I mean, if you don't have a target, you can't hit it. Um, so you got to start with self-reflection. You got to think about what do I want to do after I take the uniform off? Um, you get to choose, and which is completely foreign to most of us uh, because you've never had to choose before. And it's a blessing if you're ready. It's a curse if you're not ready. So adequate self-reflection. In the book, um, Truths About the Military Transition, we actually have some exercises that we take members through. So you start that process and, and get those uh, questions going and you start thinking about it. So um, self-reflection. Also, we highly recommend that you keep a journal as you go through the transition process. Write this stuff out. Um, and I mean, physically write it out and uh, keep that journal, keep it to your way, uh, by your side. Nobody else needs to see what you're writing. It is a personal journal, but it starts with really good self-reflection. And that leads to more realistic expectations. Service members um, don't really know, uh, they're, they're not setting the right expectations because they're not doing their homework up front. And, and so along those lines, we tell folks, um, don't feel entitled because of your rank. 
you might be a, a senior officer or senior NCO, and you're not going to go in day one and be an executive at, you know, company X. Um, we don't see, you know, an executive from company X wouldn't come in as a, uh, you know, uh, sergeant major or as a 06 colonel um, on day one. You know, they have to learn the culture, uh, learn the environment, uh, learn how we operate, and the same exists on the other side. So don't feel entitled by your rank. And the other is don't feel constrained by your military experience. You know, just because um, you were 11 Bravo in the Army doesn't mean that you have to go out and be a cop. Um, you, there's anything that you want to do can be done. You just have to identify what it is that you want to do early enough so you can develop a plan and you can get the required um, certifications, education, skills and experience that you need to transition to that role. So there are some of the kind of the macro ones that, that I definitely want to make sure that I call out because there's a lot of misinformation along along those lines. But um, yeah, uh, uh, the uh, the first book does a great job of highlighting the truths. And again, book four, the mistakes really drills on on a lot more and gets down really, really deep in in these issues. I love it. I love it. Uh, you mentioned you can't hit a target you don't have. So you, you get to choose. You get to choose and um, self-reflection. Uh, self-reflection is key. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, so with with the uh, second book, Winning the Employment Game, uh, you mentioned about, you know, how to play the game or, or, or playing the game, right? Um, what do you feel like are some of the difficulties uh, veterans or transitioning service members have when uh, in that aspect of, you know, playing the game, so to say? Yeah, well, um, so um, great question. One of the things that we make very clear is that there are two different job markets. There's an open job market and there's a hidden job market. Mm. The open job market is when jobs are advertised, you know, a company puts it on their website or it's somewhere where you can see and you see the position and you can start applying for it. Um, and that, so that's the open job market. And then there's this hidden job market. And the really great jobs are in the hidden job market. And you have to know someone or you have to some, have some type of connection to be able to access that hidden job market, which is why one of the reasons why having a network is so important. They're going to help you find those unadvertised jobs. And every major organization has unadvertised jobs. Uh, so they're going to help you find those jobs. They're also going to help you translate your skills so that you can align those skills so that whoever is making the decision, the hiring official, sees your experience and they see how you can add value in that role. So we try to call that out early in book number two, winning the employment game, the difference between the open job market and the hidden job market. And the hidden job market is the, the market that you want to go after. Um, I have talked to lots of veterans over the past two decades, and I've talked to veterans that have sent, literally sent, you know, hundreds of resumes to online ads you know, uh, open job market opportunities and never heard one thing back. Um, but as soon as they discover there's this hidden job market, um, they become much more effective. Um, so you got to learn how that game is played and uh, you got to, you know, build the network and, you, you know, it, it takes some finesse, but it's all worth it. Awesome. Great, great advice. And, you know, on the, on the third book, you, you guys talk about the transition challenges and, you know, I've heard, you know, um, interviewing other veterans um, as they transitioned out, you know, they have that, like you mentioned here is, you know, loss of purpose, loss of community or identity and things of that nature. Um, what are some ways that, what are some ways that we uh, as veterans or tra transitioning service members can, can overcome those, those challenges? The first thing is just to know that you're going to have that loss. Um, that was probably the most difficult aspect of my transition. I mentioned again that I used a recruiting firm. They helped me develop a plan and, and you know, kind of gave me a ready-made net network. What I didn't anticipate happening was um, that, you know, I defined who I was because of my military affiliation, you know, and when I took the uniform off, all of a sudden I was just Brian. And that was the hardest thing for me because I literally graduated from high school and three weeks later I was in uniform and I had spent my entire adult life in uniform up to that point. And so it defined me and I had no idea 
the um, the challenge that that was returning to civilian life and just being Brian again. Um, nobody told me. I had no idea. You know, it was like this huge gut punch, and I didn't see it coming. And so, knowing it's coming helps. It's not gonna, you know, it's not gonna let you avoid. That's not going to, uh, you know, give you avoid avoid the 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 challenge of, of uh, that loss of your identity. But that was the hardest part for me, knowing it's coming, and then having ways to be able to cope with that, uh, to to fill those voids, uh, and then that sense of meaning, sense of purpose, sense of community, um, finding ways to be able ahead of your transition to say, here are some of the things that I'm going to do. Uh, we, we are all in the service because you know we want to serve. We want to so- serve something that's bigger than ourselves. We're not there, you know, to 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 get rich. We're there to to give back. And so knowing that, and then being able to say, hey, I'm going to get involved with you know this community group. I'm going to get involved with this church group. I'm going to get involved with this national veteran service organization. And there are some amazing national VSOs that are out there today. Um, but you start thinking about that in advance. You start you know learning from your network on. Hey, what are you guys doing? And uh, you know, um, you, you get to choose, and you get to fill that void with something that's meaningful to you and to your family. It might be something as easy as you know, you have kids, and and you coach a, a little league uh, baseball team or soccer team or you know gymnastics. Uh, just getting involved so you feel that. Uh, we're trying to make it very, very clear. And again, from my personal experience, that was the hardest part for my transition is uh, filling those voids. But as you mentioned, you know, there's voids to fill, there's barriers to break, concerns to address, and limitations to overcome. And uh, it is the only place that I'm aware of where all of those challenges that members and families uh, encounter are outlined so you can see them in, in, uh, you know, just one reading. Awesome. And and again, for our audience who who, um, are just joining in, Again, those three books, you can find them on military-transition.org uh, under, under ebooks. And you, uh, Brian, you, you mentioned a fourth one that's coming up, coming out. Correct. The fourth one is called Mistakes, uh, military, to, uh, uh, military Transition Mistakes. And it's got the 12 most common mistakes that we have seen over the past two decades. And, um, you know, they're really impactful. So outlines the mistakes and then ways to avoid and overcome them. Awesome. So be on be on the lookout for that fourth fourth uh, ebook. Uh, so so Brian, going into the second segment of our podcast here. So this is what I call the Fast Five. It's the same five questions I ask all my guests. Are you ready? I am ready. All right. So first question: What's one hobby you enjoy? Red and I um, I like cooking. Uh, maybe I should say I like eating, but uh, <laughs> I like I like cooking. And uh, I mentioned earlier that I live in Cincinnati. Cincinnati has this amazing store. It's called Jungle Gyms, and it's like featured on the Food Network. And it's like you know several football fields big. It's massive, and it's an international market, right? So you can get food from all over the world. These amazing tastes, and so I love to go to the jungle and uh, I sample all these different foods. Uh, so uh, cooking. Uh, but largely because I just love tasting all these different flavors from around around the world. Cooking and Jungle Gym. You recommend going to Jungle Gyms. Yeah, if you're ever in Cincinnati, Ohio, Jungle Gyms is amazing. You will not be disappointed. <laughs> awesome. Uh, so second question here, Brian. If you had to choose one person to hang out with for one day, who would it be and why? Uh, I'm going to break the rules. I'm going to give you two, but I'll make it quick. Uh, the first one would definitely have to be uh, Jesus uh, because uh, no other uh, individual has had a greater impact on the entire human race throughout history. And then also he impacted my life too. Uh, and so I, I'm, a, I'm a Christian and I would love to, to spend the day with, with Jesus. Uh, the second one is my mom. Uh, so I lost my mom when I was 20 years old. And at the time, you know, I was, um, I was still a kid. I had gone off to the academy. I had, you know, put the uniform on. So I never really got a chance to talk to my mom as an adult, uh, you know, and like talk to her like as a, as a friend. And uh, I would love to just spend a day with her being able to talk to her like a friend and is uh, as, as an adult and, you know, sharing my adult experiences with her. Well, I'm sure she's uh, she's proud of uh, what you're doing now and help, helping especially our community with with the work that you're doing. So thanks. Thanks. Um, Brian, next question. Recommend a book for our audience to read. Okay. Well, I'm going to recommend four of them. Uh, they're all <laughs> the transition. But aside from those four, um, 
Uh, I'm going to break the rules here again, too. I'm going to add a couple more books. The first one, um, anything from Zig Ziglar. Man, I love Ziglar. He is amazing. And if you had maybe pick just one of his books, I would say the book See You at the Top. Uh, and it's better, actually, if you listen to him, do it on audiobook. Uh, he is just absolutely amazing. Um, and then, uh, so I listen to gobs of audiobooks. Uh, I drive all the time and I go through them constantly. So I've got a whole laundry list of great books. But the one that caught me off guard recently that I did not expect to be so good, and I recommend it, is uh, Think Like a Monk by Joe Shetty. I just, I had no idea how amazing it was going to be. It really caught me off guard. I had low expectations and it well exceeded all expectations. Think, and you said that was Think Like a Monk by Jay Shetty. Yep, Joe okay. Shetty. Oh, Joe Shetty. Okay, I, have to, uh, I haven't heard of that one yet. I'll have to check that out. Um, all right, next question. What's your favorite quote and why? Man, I'm going to break the rules again. I mentioned, I already said my favorite quote. I, we, we did into our earlier conversation. You can't hit a target you don't have. That is so true in life. And that one was uh, Tony Robbins. Um, I also love um, a, a Ziegler quote. Uh, favorite Ziegler quote is, you can have everything in life you want if just help and help other people get what they want. Think about that for a second. Who's your boss? What does your boss want? How do you help your boss get what they want? Um, and so, you know, our goal is to help service members get what they want, a successful transition back into civilian life. So that's quote number two. Quote three, feedback is the breakfast of champions. And that's from Dr. Ken Blanchard. That is so true in life. Feedback, the breakfast of champions. And last, when Wayne Gretzky became athlete of the decade, they asked him how he became athlete of the decade. And he said it was simple. I skated where the puck was going, not where the puck is at. Oh, yeah. I've, I've heard that several times, too. And, uh, uh, yeah, that's, that's, a, that's a great quote. That's a great quote. It, it, it applies any, in anything, right? Not just sports. It does. Yeah, yeah, no. It pl yeah, exactly right. Um, all right, so, Brian, final question here. What do you see yourself in five years or even ten years from now? Yeah, uh, in five years, um, I see myself as uh, being extremely busy uh, writing gobs more transition guidebooks. Um, we're plotting out, um, we've got uh, a total of seven that we'll actually right now that we're actually working on. So we'll have a total of seven within the next year or so. Uh, and then beyond that, I want to do a lot more work to help service members. And I want to move over to the other side and do a lot more work with the employers to help them understand the value that veterans bring. So in five years, we'll have probably at least 10 guidebooks by then and much more active uh, with, uh, with the employers. Wow, that's 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 awesome, man. Um, again, Brian, and for for those our audience, uh, the website is military-transitions.org. Make sure you guys go check it out. They're helping over. They've helped over what thirty million or so military members. Um, well, that that includes you know families, veterans, and and the ones in active duty. Uh, Brian, man, I, I salute you for for the work that you all are doing. Um, one final thing before we go here, where can our audience, where can they follow you? Where can they support you at? Um, yes. Um, so obviously the website, you mentioned it before, military-transition.org. Then I'm also on LinkedIn. I think I'm the only Brian Nice Wonder on LinkedIn. Um, and I post a lot of things on LinkedIn around the transition process. And I'm also sharing a lot more just life and career lessons as well. So um, you see a, a lot of posts that are there. And a lot of things that we do that might not always make it onto the website. So website, military-transition.org, LinkedIn. We're on, you know, Facebook. We're on Instagram and all that as well. But really, um, the, the preponderance of our content that we're sharing is uh, LinkedIn is the best place to be able to get it. Awesome. Again, Brian, I appreciate the time. Uh, for those who are listening in, make sure you go to the website. Grab all the uh, the free resources that Military Transitions provides. And uh, Brian, again, thanks for your your time, and uh, talk to you soon. Redden, thanks so much, uh, and I truly appreciate it. Awesome. Take care. Hey everyone, Raiden here. I just want to thank you for listening to our podcast, and make sure you guys go check out our website fortist-fidelis.com again that's fortist-fidelis.com 
and learn how you can help us support in providing these memorial coins to 